Hello, everyone, and welcome to our worship time together, April the 3rd, 2022, fifth Sunday in Lent. Hey, you know what's coming up next week? Palm Sunday, Sunday of the Passion. But for now, we have a special scripture passage from the Gospel of John that we'll be looking at today, and it's one that makes us ponder what is coming, not only for Jesus, but also how are we to live our lives in the meantime, as we wait for his coming again. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters our desert. Open our hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing, that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love given to all. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. This is what God says, the God who builds a road right through the ocean, who carves a path through pounding waves, the God who summons horses and chariots and armies. They lie down and then can't get up. They're snuffed out like so many candles. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert. Rivers in the badlands. Wild animals will say, thank you. The coyotes and the buzzards. Because I provided water in the desert, rivers through the sun-baked earth. Drinking water for the people I chose. The people I made especially for myself. A people custom made to praise me. This ends our first lesson. Our second reading is from the third chapter of Philippians. Steer clear of the barking dogs. Those religious busybodies. All bark no bite. All they're interested in is appearances, knife-happy circumcisers, I call them. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it, even though we can list what may many may think are impressive credentials. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down for God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing away with the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, and everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog done. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I haven't made, but I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. And our gospel lessons recorded in the 12th chapter of John. 
Six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus, so recently raised from the dead, was living. Lazarus and his sisters invited Jesus to dinner at their home. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those sitting at the table with them. Mary came in with a jar of very expensive aromatic oils, anointed and massaged Jesus' feet, and then wiped them with her hair. The fragrance of the oils filled the house. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, even then getting ready to betray him, said, Why wasn't this sold and money given to the poor? It would have easily brought 300 silver pieces. He said this because he cared two cents about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of their common funds, but also embezzled them. Jesus said, let her alone. She's anticipating and honoring the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you. You don't always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, it's a very interesting gospel lesson. It's one in which we see anticipated Jesus' own death. Now, what's happening here? Remember, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they're Jesus' best friends outside of the group of disciples. And just before this dinner that they had, Lazarus had died. And Jesus came and said, Lazarus, come out of there. And he walked out of that tomb. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him loose. And there he was, free as a bird, free from death. Now, that's what's often known as a revivification and, and not really a resuscitation, but and not really a resurrection, not the resurrection that we anticipate, not the resurrection that Jesus experienced, but Jesus put the life back into him and he came out fully alive. So now he's having dinner with them. Maybe it was a thank you meal. Thanks, Jesus, for um, giving me life. <laughs> Maybe we need to think about doing that a little more often ourselves because Jesus has given us life, new life. But let's get back to the story. Uh, as they're sitting there at the table, and evidently Jesus' disciples had come along too. Oh, they, they come along with him everywhere he goes. So it's, it's a big, big meal that's all spread out everywhere. And here comes Mary with this expensive jar of oil. They say it's about a year's worth of wages. That's if you're working 20 hours a week and putting in your 40 hours a week. That's a heck of a lot of money, folks. That's a lot of money. No wonder Judas is all oh, gaggly-eyed at, at that oil that's being poured on Jesus' feet, and then Mary uses her own hair to, to wipe it clean. That That's something really weird. You see, when you invited someone over to eat, of course, you're walking the dusty streets barefoot or in sandals, and... The host always provided water for you to wash your feet. And <clears throat> if you decided to put some on, there would be a little flask of some oil. Not that expensive. Just enough to kind of take the stink away. Well, um, here Mary is at Jesus' feet, cleaning his feet with this oil and her hair. What is that all about? And, and yeah... Judas is all upset because, well, as John lets us in on in, on this passage, he's the one that's, uh, you know, skimming off some of the money for himself, embezzling it. And he comes up with this very pious little saying, we could have sold all that and given it to the poor. What a waste. You know what? That's very true. Could have done it. And I bet you there's even things we in the church could do with our money and be better off doing it that way. And maybe we need to think about that. Maybe those words aren't so harsh unless they're coming from a devious soul and they're not really honest words. 
their words is, that basically are saying, gee, look what I'm missing out on, some of, skimming some of that money. But <clears throat> no, no, that's what this isn't all about. That's, in Judas's mind, that was money he wasn't going to be able to touch. But that's missing the whole point of the story. This is about what Mary does for Jesus. Mary, who has seen Jesus raise her brother from the dead. Mary, who's so overwhelmed with, with joy that when they invite Jesus over for dinner, what does she do? She pours out the good stuff, the good oil on his feet, expensive oil, oil that probably is usually reserved for a funeral, you know, to cover the stench of death. It says the perfume, the perfumey smell filters through the whole house. Everyone gets to enjoy it. Even Lazarus, who was the source of the stench of death just days earlier, now is filled with this smell of life, the smell of perfume. Um, can, can you imagine being there in the house and smelling that? Can you imagine trying to figure out Judas and, and what's he up to and what he's complaining about? Can you imagine how so often we possibly do the same thing? I mean, I think it's well and fine and good that we, in our church council meetings, in our annual meetings, even in our little groups amongst ourselves, we talk about spending our money wisely, raising money for just causes and all that. And, and that's what we need to do and we should do. But where's Jesus in all of this? You see, Jesus in this story is about to die. And I think Mary knows what's going on. I think Mary knew the score, and Mary needed to show her love and care and concern for Jesus. You, you know, it is good that we are wise when it comes to our spending and wise where we send our monies. I know I am right now. With the war in Ukraine, there's 20 gazillion groups that are collecting money that you can uh, give to. But it's so important that the money goes and gets there to the people to help them and not for all the, you know, the mundane parts. And yeah, there there is some expense in collecting money and getting it funneled over there and not buying the food. Yes, we all know that. But you want most of your buck going toward feeding the people and helping them in their time of need. And I understand that. But there's also a time to show our love, our utmost love for Jesus and what he's about to do for us. Giving it all for you and for me. How do we express our thanks how do we give our all? Mary certainly did it in a very extravagant way. I think we can do the same with our gifts of love that we pour out extravagantly on those around us, especially those in need. And we don't need to complain like Judas either. We do it with open hearts. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Do a new thing in the church. Free us from paradigms that no longer serve the gospel and bring forward leaders who imagine fresh ways of doing ministry. Give us courage in the face of change. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing for creation. Reverse the trajectory of climate change and environmental catastrophe. Revive habitats already impaired by human disregard. 
amplified the voices of climate scientists and researchers working to chart a new course. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing in our world. Break barriers that prevent political enemies from working together for the well-being of all. Make a way for peace and collaboration among the nations. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing for those who suffer. Reveal a path for any who are unemployed or underemployed, for those experiencing homelessness, and for all who struggle with money. Comfort those who grieve and restore those who are sick. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing within us. Direct us into encounters that broaden our understanding of the human experience. Amplify voices that are ignored or devalued. Deliver us especially from the scourge of racism. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing in our death. Fill us with the knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection as we give thanks for all the saints who have attained the prize of their heavenly call. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Enjoy this wonderful and glorious day.